Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another session of PHI 331. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Elizabeth Anderson's paper, What is the Point of Quality? This is actually going to be our first of two sessions about this same paper. Uh, so for this session, we're just going to be talking about the first half of the paper up to, I believe, page 312. Uh, so uh, we'll get right to it. Uh, just a quick remark. I hope that everybody's doing OK uh, in light of all of this uh, coronavirus uh, stuff. Uh, Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to still, uh, you know, have a productive time with this class, and I hope that everybody's doing well. And indeed, uh, you know, uh, given that this is a class in political philosophy, you might start thinking about how you might even uh, try to work a current event such as this one uh, into your final paper. Uh, it'll be up to you to uh, write your own or come up with your own final topic for the paper. So if you want to write uh, something about how issues related to equality and inequality uh, relate to something like coronavirus, or maybe issues related to paternalism, um, that would be uh, certainly a good idea and uh, very much a welcome one. So uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, equality and inequality. This is going to uh, bounce off of and be a continuation of some of the things that we learned about in Rawls last time around. So here's the plan for today. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the basics about uh, Elizabeth Anderson, the philosopher that we're going to be reading this week. Uh, we're going to get clear on the concept of luck egalitarianism. We're going to think about how it connects to Rawls, and we're going to think about some basics of, I, of the idea. Uh, we're going to get clear on some of its fundamental concepts, like brute luck and option luck, and uh, why there's, they're supposed to be important for the theory. Uh, but then uh, we're also going to look at uh, Anderson's criticisms of the luck egalitarian theory. So she thinks that it makes mistakes in the ways it treats victims of bad option luck and bad brute luck. We're going to get clear on uh, what these two different kinds of bad luck are uh, and why Anderson finds uh, the luck egalitarian's treatment of those kinds of bad luck um, unsatisfying. So uh, let's get on with things. So here are just some things that you might like to know about Elizabeth Anderson. Uh, so she has taught at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor uh, since the 1980s. Um, and if you want to learn more about Elizabeth Anderson, uh, how she does her work, uh, some things about her life, as well as uh, how she's uh, continued with some of her ideas in the 20 years since her What's the Point of Equality art article, uh, you should have a look at this uh, New Yorker article. Uh, that I sent around uh, in the module last week. So Anderson is influenced by pragmatists like Dewey. We'll actually be reading some Dewey later in the semester when we start thinking about democracy. Um, and she also uh, has connections to and treats as an intellectual influence John Stuart Mill. Um, in the way that they approach uh, liberalism. Uh, Anderson is also impressed with this idea of Mills, which we looked at briefly of how we engage in experiments and living, um, and that this is how we you know, figure out uh, the rules that we should live by. Uh, so some other work that Anderson has done. So she's got a book called Value and Ethics and Economics. Uh, so trying to get those uh, fields to talk to each other rather than simply past each other. Uh, in 2014, she wrote a book called The Imperative of Integration, a book about racial inequality and how America has dealt with, um, yeah, inequities in education, especially since Brown versus the Board of Education. 
uh, ruling that the Supreme Court made. Uh, and most recently, she released a book called Private Government, How Employers Rule Our Lives and Why We Think About It. Uh, so that's a book sort of about um, how we want to think about how businesses control our lives uh, in the fact that uh, freedom is a value that we have. So uh, these are just like some of the strands that come through in Anderson's work. Uh, she was a recent winner of uh, what's called the MacArthur Fellowship, uh, which is sometimes referred to as a genius grant, often given to artists and other thinkers. Uh, philosophers don't tend to win it that often. So Anderson is the first in about 25 years as a philosopher uh, employed in the philosophy department to win the MacArthur Fellowship. And this is a grant given to creative people uh, to help them uh, follow through with uh, an interesting and important project. So we may well be seeing some uh, interesting, important, uh, and maybe lengthy books uh, by Anderson uh, in the near future. So enough with this biographical information. Uh, here are some apparent problems with egalitarianism, as Anderson likes them at the beginning of her paper. Uh, so one is the worry that egalitarianism is based on envy. So if we trust Dworkin, Dworkin says that uh, what we want to aim for in egalitarianism is an envy-free distribution of resources. So if we're trying to get rid of envy, we might worry that that's too much of a focus in the egalitarian thought. Some egalitarians have argued that even lazy surfers, so somebody who's able-bodied but who does not want to contribute to the economic system in any way, does not want to do any work, you know, just wants to hang out on the beach, lazily surf, smoke weed, whatever that comes to, uh, well, some people like Van Perry have argued that uh, even these lazy surfers uh, deserve welfare or a basic income. Uh, Richard Arneson has argued that uh, costly religious ceremonies should be funded by taxpayers. Um, and G.A. Cohen has argued that people should be given uh, compensation for having gloomy dispositions. So if you are sad a lot, uh, maybe you deserve a check from the government, or if you have a taste for expensive hobbies. Uh, so, you know, if you only can be happy, if you have, you know, fine scotch whiskeys and uh, high-end bars, uh, then those are things that the government should be providing you with. Uh, Anderson says that these are sort of shocking and deeply implausible uh, implications of egalitarianism. So she says that if all this academic work defending equality had been secretly paid by conservatives, you know, people like Nozick, uh, could the results be any more embarrassing for egalitarians? Anderson's big idea here is that egalitarians like Cohen, Arson, Van Puri, and Borkin, uh, they are drawing these implausible and apparently embarrassing conclusions uh, because they've misunderstood what equality is all about. So that's what Anderson is going to try to fix uh, in the lengthy paper of hers. So today, uh, we're not going to talk about uh, the full answer to the question of what the point of equality really is. Uh, we're just going to talk about how, mis how misunderstanding, according to Anderson, has uh, crept into the way we think about equality. So here's uh, the view that Anderson is going to be attacking. It's called luck egalitarianism, and other times it's referred to as a quality of fortune. So you can think of this view as sort of an extension of some thoughts that we had in Rawls. So here are some things uh, that Rawls told us. Remember, we had justice as fairness, 
uh, we're going to pick an ordering of principles for society that we agree on from the original position. So justice as fairness is going to have a fair original setup for society. Uh, and because uh, the principles were chosen without favoring anyone in particular, uh, we can treat those as um, a, just, a just structuring for our institutions. And then Rawls also told us that one of the things that we agree to in the original position, that is from behind the veil of ignorance, is that we will only accept inequality if the inequalities improve the situation of those who are worst off in society. Now, a further thought that we saw in Rawls was this thought that your unearned good fortune, uh, so the fact that you were born to wealthy parents, uh, well, the place that you're born into society into uh, is not something that you earned. It's morally arbitrary. Um, and if you're born with more talent or more aptitude for hard work, uh, these talents should be treated according to rules as a common resource. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to redistribute some of these common goods uh, to each member of society so that everybody is made well off and that we're making sure that everybody gets something uh, from the agreement that we choose from original position. So luck egalitarianism you might think springs out of this Rawlsian approach. Uh, now Anderson says that she doesn't actually think that Rawls would accept uh, luck egalitarianism, uh, but that's a question for another day or something that we can talk about on the forums. So here's what the luck egalitarians say. They say that people should be compensated for undeserved misfortunes. Uh, so if you're born uh, into a family that's not wealthy, uh, you should be compensated for that misfortune. Uh, and it can go into other areas as well. So you might think if you're born less good looking or less intelligent than others, uh, you should be compensated for that. And that compensation should only come from the good fortune of others that's not deserved by them. So you don't deserve to be born to the parents you're born to. You don't deserve to be tall or good looking. Uh, or apt to do difficult work. So, uh, insofar as you have good fortune that you don't deserve, the government can pack and redistribute those good fortunes. Now, we should note that there are many different versions of local egalitarianism. So, some of them want to equalize resources, uh, some of them want to equalize welfare, and they might uh, think about some other sort of material or subjective condition uh, that we should work to make equal. So that's, that's the view that the luck egalitarian takes. Uh, now, important distinction that we'll find when we start thinking about luck egalitarianism, and that's the distinction between option luck and brute luck. So there's a thought here which is that there's some bad luck uh, that you don't deserve, and there's some bad luck which you do deserve, or which in another sense is traceable back to your voluntary choices. So we can think about bad luck uh, that results from your voluntary choice versus bad luck that does not result from your voluntary choice. So the luck egalitarian will tell you that insofar as something is traceable to your choices, that's option luck. And if it's not result of choices, then it's called brute luck. So being born with a disability, for instance, being born deaf is supposed to be an instance of brute luck. Uh, being deaf is not traceable to the choice that you make. So people who 
accept a quality of fortune or brute luck, basic, or, or look egalitarianism, we'll say, uh, justice will require a redistribution of good fortune in the case of brute luck, but it does not require such a di redistribution in the case of option luck. So if you're born deaf uh, through no choice of your own, that is a case of brute luck. Uh, and those sorts of things uh, require a redistribution of a fortune to make up for your bad luck. But, but um, if your bad luck, if a bad predicament is traceable uh, to your voluntary choices, then that is not something that justice uh, entitles you to uh, any sort of compensation. So if you lose your money while gambling or an entrepreneurial project, for instance, uh, well, that's tough luck, right? That's bad luck that you don't get compensation for. So the thought is that luck egalitarians would view the welfare state as a giant insurance company uh, that insures you against bad brute luck. So we might think that we all, all, all uh, would buy into and against, to keep using this one example I've been using, uh, being deaf. Uh, and that if uh, you end up with this bad luck, uh, then the state will recompensate you for it. So again, uh, and this is a terribly important point, but uh, there are different versions of luck egalitarianism. So there are resource egalitarians, which makes sure that everybody gets the same resources. Uh, now, you know, we might think that that's the resource-based theory is good because the theory doesn't have to give all these extra resources to people who are irresponsible or self-indulgent or people with expensive tastes, right? Uh, you know, if everybody uh, is entitled to decent food and a good loaf bread every day, um, then that's what you get. Uh, if you're self-indulgent or you don't know how to keep your bread, well, that's your problem. But uh, it's also been pointed out that resource egalitarianism uh, does not uh, easily account for the fact that people with disabilities uh, won't have a right to all the goods that they need. Uh, so you might need to give, uh, you know, an income supplement to people with uh, a certain disability but that can't be made sense of on resource egalitarianism, where we're trying to make everybody equal in terms of their resources. Now, we might go for a welfare egalitarianism, which means if it costs more to make disabled people well off, then that is the explanation why we give them some extra resource. Uh, so that's a strong theory, right? Explains how people with handicaps are entitled as a matter of justice to more resources. Uh, the problem with this is that, again, uh, we run into the people with expensive taste. You know, a person might say, it wasn't my choice uh, that I only prefer uh, to have front row seats at the opera than to drink fine wine. If I don't get these things, uh, I will be very unhappy. Well, according to welfare egalitarianism, apparently these people would be entitled as a matter of justice to their front row seats at the opera and wine, stuff like that. Um, so Anderson is already seeing um, problems with egalitarianism when we start trying to make levels of welfare or uh, allotment of resources equal. So, uh, remember the thought for like egalitarianism is that we compensate people for bad option 
for bad brute luck, right? Uh, that's the stuff that you didn't, it's not traceable to your choices, like being born deaf. Uh, but then uh, it's also going to say that we don't recompensate people for bad option luck, right? So if you lose your money gambling, then that's your own problem. Uh, Anderson thinks that so far as we cut people off from recompensation, if their bad, bad situation is traceable to a bad decision, uh, it's going to have a bunch of implausible results. So first, she says there's discrimination among the state. So the question here would be, would we limit access to things like ramps if a person became disabled as the result of a bad decision? Uh, this person became wheelchair bound uh, because of an illegal maneuver that they made in their vehicle or through drunk driving? Uh, would it be uh, acceptable to not let them onto the ramp into the post office, for instance? Uh, so Anderson says that at one level, we might object to that kind of thing just as a matter of application and trying to discriminate between uh, you know, wheelchair users who uh, are in that wheelchair because of a choice as compared to uh, people who need to be in a wheelchair just because of the way that they were born. Anderson says that it's a deeper issue than that. Right? It's not just about figuring out how uh, each person got into their situation. Anderson thinks that uh, there's some deeply unjust about making certain parts of public life inaccessible or just cutting a person off because we've deemed their actions to be irresponsible. Uh, so get problems of geographical discrimination. Where you live uh, is going to be traceable to decisions that you make. Uh, then the thought would be, well, then if you live in a place that's prone to disasters, say if you live on the Gulf Coast or on the East Coast, uh, you're more likely uh, to be struck by a hurricane. Or if you live in California, perhaps an earthquake. Uh, should we say that that's a matter of bad option luck? So these citizens are entitled to no compensation uh, when they're victims of natural disasters? Uh, Anderson says no. That's, again, implausible. Furthermore, we have things like occupational discrimination. Uh, should a logger uh, not get access to health care resources uh, simply because uh, the risks of being a logger are somewhat known? Or if somebody joins the military um, out of a feeling of patriotism rather than draft, it doesn't seem uh, very fair or just to say that, well, these people don't deserve any help or any compensation because uh, their bad predicaments, their injuries that they incur are simply a matter of choices that they knew the risks of. Finally, uh, Anderson points out that localitarianism does not account to the duties that we have to dependent caretakers. So dependent caretakers are people who often care for children or aging family. Uh, in, in many cases, uh, these people, usually women, uh, are vulnerable to exploitation uh, and also hardship. Uh, because of their positions as dependent caretakers. Uh, but the egalitarian will say, we do not have any duty uh, to help or compensate dependent caretakers because the thought is, uh, it's a choice to be a dependent caretaker. Uh, so there shouldn't be extra compensation or protection for uh, women in those positions, who are often um, at risk of exploitation and also um, abuse in some cases. 
Uh, Anderson even points out that even the prudent are not supposed to be compensated for bad option luck. Uh, because uh, if there is a rare deal that you get, uh, the idea is if you not purchase insurance against that disease, find the veil of ignorance, you might not. Uh, the disease is rare enough from um, a rational point of view. Uh, then it would seem that society has no obligation to uh, compensate you or come to your aid uh, in those cases. So Anderson's point uh, in all these cases for how luck egalitarianism is dealing with bad option luck is that it fails to treat people with respect. So the thought here would be, um, even if people make bad decisions, or even if a person's situation is something that they might have avoided, uh, say by purchase insurance or by moving to a different part of the country, uh, Anderson says a theory that tries to have no concern for such people, uh, which is basically what uh, luck egalitarians try to do when they introduce this notion of option luck. Uh, Anderson thinks that that's going to be deeply implausible. Uh, but it gets worse because you might think that egalitarians have like a little bit of trouble or seem a little bit heartless towards those who are victims of bad option luck, but at least they're looking after people with bad luck, right? The person who gets compensation for being born uh, deaf, for instance. Because remember, the whole idea of equality of fortune or luck egalitarianism is the idea that we want to compensate those who suffer misfortunes that they do not choose. But Anderson says that actually this is also a failure to treat uh, these victims of bad brute luck with respect. So she gives an example of a letter on page 305. It's supposed to be like a hypothetical letter uh, that somebody would get from the state. So if you got a letter from the state saying, uh, we understand that you are one of the less good looking people in society. But we understand that your bad looks uh, were not your own decision. Uh, but uh, we're going to give you some money, which will hopefully make you a more attractive uh, partner. Uh, good luck with all that. Uh, if you were to get uh, such compensation from the state, you know, for having worse looks or less intelligence than others, there would be something wrong with that. And the way that he puts it, this would be a mistake of putting an official stamp on a private judgment. So some things are not supposed to be uh, determined by state. Anderson thinks that one of those things would be determinations of uh, your looks or your intelligence or your worth as a friend, right? Uh, and insofar as we do this, we make official stamps on these private judgments. Uh, Anderson is also saying that luck egalitarianism depends on pity instead of compassion. So your thought is that compassion focuses on someone's actual state of misery, uh, what it absolutely is or what it objectively is, but, compa but pity, on the other hand, uh, is all about uh, a comparative judgment. When you pity somebody, we say, oh, that poor thing, how much worse they are doing than I am, right? Uh, and Anderson says that when we make a judgment that somebody is the victim of bad, brute luck, we're saying that they have less intelligence than others, even though they didn't deserve it. They have less intelligence than the average person. Uh, and when we do that, uh, it's not just about recognizing somebody's situation and be for them on that path. It 
shows a certain kind of contempt. Like it literally means um, to look down on someone in this kind of situation. So Anderson's whole point in these criticisms is that she's saying that the luck egalitarian approach uh, to dealing with justice as she puts it, is kind of the point of equality and egalitarianism. So her thought is that egalitarianism is really about treating citizens with equal respect and concern. So here's how Anne puts it, nice little quote. She said, quote, egalitarianism ought to reflect a generous, humane, cosmopolitan vision of a society that recognizes individuals as equals in all their diversity. It should promote institutional arrangements that enable the diversity of people's talents, aspirations, roles, and cultures to benefit everyone and to be recognized as mutually beneficial. So this is sort of like the egalitarian ideal that Anderson is aiming for, that we're uh, all different, but we all have something uh, that when we get together can be mutually beneficial. Um, and it really tries to treat everyone as equals. In the next session, we'll get down to the details of what uh, treating everyone as equals actually comes to. But the thought here is that we want to make sure that our institutional arrangements uh, are set up to show uh, respect for all, even in light of diversity. Uh, so uh, to review uh, the problems with luck egalitarianism, or in its other name, quality of fortune, she says it offers no aid to those that it labels irresponsible. So those who failed to purchase insurance or whose misfortune is traceable to their bad choices, those are supposed to be the irresponsible ones, and then humiliating aid to those it labels innately inferior. So those that it labels as, you know, just inherently less good looking or intelligent and therefore uh, worthy of pity and uh, compensation. So here's just one last way of putting it. Anderson says that luck egalitarianism combines the worst parts of both capitalism and socialism. So she says, on the one hand, it tries to justify not helping victims of bad option luck. Uh, so by trying to make everything about voluntary choice and about each person looking out for themselves, uh, she thinks that that's like the worst part about capitalism, right? On the other hand, uh, insofar as luck egalitarianism tries to say, well, you do get compensation for things if it's not really your fault, if it's not from your own doing, then you do get compensation. Well, Anderson points out there that such an approach is going to incentivize uh, denying personal responsibility for your bad luck. So everything is the fault of others and it makes people um, dependent and uh, irresponsible and more liable to make excuses for everything. So worst parts of capitalism and worst parts of socialism, according to Anderson. So just to close up, uh, here's some things uh, that we might want to think about for next time. Um, if promoting equality isn't about correcting cosmic injustices, then what is it about? So that's something to think about. It is hinted that her favorite theory is called democratic equality, and it's about creating a community in which people stand in relations of equality to others. So uh, next time around, we're going to spend some time actually spelling out uh, what Anderson uh, means by creating this kind of community in which people stand in relations of equality to others. So that's the plan. Next session, we'll finish the rest of this lengthier paper by Anderson. So you'll start at page 12 and uh, go to the end. So 
thanks for listening in today. Again, uh, I hope everybody's uh, doing well uh, in light of these uh, weird uh, times of uh, social distancing. Um, and please, uh, if you have any uh, concerns or practical issues uh, dealing with the course in these weird times, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch, and I'll do what I can to help you out. So thanks for listening in. I will, as always, look forward to reading what you have to say on the boards, and I'll look forward to checking in with you all next time. Okay, take care. Bye.